There are many reasons to make your way through Lesotho. Spectacular scenery of the rugged mountains, massive dongas and sparkling waterfalls that inspire a sense of awe in any man and brings him just that little bit closer to nature. But like any great adventure, it's not going to be easy, not even a little bit. Three o'clock in the morning on the 16th of July, the 17 of us ready nine four by fours and two quads to tackle Baboon's Pass in the middle of winter. Morning guys, we uh, in Konak now, busy filling up with juice. It's now, what about just after five o'clock, half past five, a little bit on the chill side. And the uh, trip's going well so far. We are nine vehicles, a little bit more than what we originally thought we were going to be. And yeah, on our way. So we're excited and ready to, ready to want to hit the road and get going. Thinking about the challenge makes any adventure lover's heart race, but we were unsure of what to expect, having heard many horror stories of what lies ahead in the snow. Between Aliwal North and the border post, and we hit the much needed roadworks in the area, where we had to dodge crater like potholes before we swiftly checked through the SA side of the border post. We were a bit worried about the Lesotho side, but we were welcomed with a toothy grin and a mountain of paperwork that took us about 30 minutes behind us. What are we doing now? We are now paying money and getting stamped. And you're officially in Lesotho. What did you think about that dodgings ride? That no, was nice, uh, especially with that trailer. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> I was fine, I was worried about the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> There, we were pleasantly surprised by the excellent conditions of the roads compared to what we faced an hour ago on the opposite side of the border. We had to head through several small towns as we came closer and closer to Baboon's Pass. Moving through the streets of these towns, we noticed an interesting phenomenon. 99% of the taxis were Toyotas, with only one Nissan seen cruising down the main road. Stopping in the last town to fill up our tanks and stock up on supplies, because from here, we set off for the unknown. Okay. I've driven stock cars, racing cars, Chef can -Ams. I've done everything. Driven racing motorbikes. I've never been 4x4. Why didn't you do this at home, Philip? I did, but uh, clearly I made a, a soapy knot here, not a boot or not. So yeah, it took a lot. In Philip's defense, he did tie that knot with a broken shoulder. Now we set off into the real Lesotho, the mountain kingdom, a tiny country in the middle of South Africa. It's a landscape defined by its rocky, savage peaks and distant gorges at this time of year. It's a winter wonderland that promises adventure to the brave, any 4x4 enthusiast's stream. Looking at the locals, you can see that the sale of gumboots and blankets are at an all-time high. Both men and women invariably wear the wool Basutu blanket as a cloak, regardless of the season. A careful selection of colour and pattern allows for each individual expression. Taking a moment to deflate our tyres as we leave, civilization is now behind us and we go off-road for the pass. Basutu is a country with an estimated population of 2 million people. That's 1 million people less than the city of Durban. Perhaps a reason why its beauty has remained untouched for so long is the lack of population. Searching for what we came here for, the start of the Baboon's Fast 4x4 trail. The silver-haired members of our group, Rossi and Leon, left their vehicles at the beginning of the trail opted to traverse the rest on quads. Yonder Ritter, ahead of us in the green Jeep Cherokee. Juan van Royen, also known as Bolly, with his co-drivers Dale Stock and Andrew Ogden, tackling the pass in his Pajero. 
Interesting fact about Bonnie's vehicle is that it was bought for under 35,000 Rand and this will be the second time he completes this trail. Andre Bjerneke drives a short wheelbase Wrangler. He's accompanied by Dennis Spicer. One point five kilometers into the route, and the Ford Ranger driven by Jeff Sampson is having some difficulty. Managing this extra challenge for Jeff is that his Ford Ranger is overloaded. So we pack rocks to help Jeff get the clearance he needs to get through. The locals behind us deciding if they can get home faster if they walk just around us. First lesson learned that day was making it through the Boone's Pass requires a lot of teamwork. How many beers are you going to have to give your friends for packing all these rocks? Six. Guess what? Lovely! We are? Of the Boone's. The range is belly up, Phil's reversing. We, we found an alternate route around the rock section and we've got about an hour and a half of light and probably an hour before it starts raining so if we don't get to our campsite soon it's going to be very muddy and then very very difficult. Jeff's still battling as we moved over for the plan B using a high lift jack to get his front wheel to get the traction needed to progress. Shortly after that we reached our next obstacle. The section of ground was very eroded so we decided to go up the right hand side. With a loud crack, he broke his left rear sh side shaft, and we decided that setting up camp close by was perhaps the best option for now. Are you paid per stone, or what, per minute? Or? <laughs> First night we have uh, done about 1.5 k's and uh, yeah, we now one vehicle down. Looks like a crown wheel opinion has snapped or a side shaft has snapped. We're going to run him back down to Ravabanta tomorrow morning early, bring him back up with a quad and climb into one of the other vehicles. And yeah, but uh, I think a very exciting two days ahead of us considering we've only done uh, one and a half k's in about four hours. So, yeah. Okay, is, is the route still doable in one day? Or what? No, we won't get we won't get to go tomorrow in one day. No, way. no I mean this this is the easier part, and yeah, I think tomorrow we're going to be doing a hell of a lot of packing and a lot more uh, winching and stuff like that. So no, we need more things tomorrow. Surviving the miserable cold of the night, we woke up to the flakes of snow drifting down on us while we huddled to keep ourselves and our breakfast warm. Oh, it's not hunger. Mm. The breakfast I never had. <laughs> Do you like it? Mmm, mmm, mmm. Don't you? Yeah. Oh, that's a healthy oat also. Yogurt and... Yeah. I wish. So, how did you guys sleep last night? No, it was alright. It's fine. But attend all that. Yeah, not too bad. Give us an interview quickly, man. Okay. <laughs> that morning, Jeff headed back to Ramabanta trading post and would return with the help of Dale on the quad. While he heads down, Andre and his dads head up, and it took a whole five minutes before they had to start packing rock. Donovan and his short wheelbase Landy doing very well on this trail so far. Clearly not the first time Donovan's been on a 4x4 trail. In the highlands, snow is common in the month of June, a long rainy season during the summer months, 
December to February, combined with the freezing conditions in the winter, June to August, creates adverse travel conditions which isolate much of the highland areas. A wealth of rivers and waterfalls make the Sutu valuable to the surrounding arid industrial areas of South Africa. Every now and then, we reach a picturesque village with the most spectacular scenic no, I agree views. With you there. <laughs> The other half of our expedition, traversing the terrain with more capable vehicles that possess much better ground clearance and bigger tyres meant they were progressing much faster than us. Derek Faree, aka Blowdave, a well-known 4x4 driver in the Eastern Cape, especially at competitions, has a huge Isuzu fan tackling those large boulders. Derek is the only guy on this trail who we didn't have to push or pull. <laughs> the higher we climb, the colder it started to get. By this stop, the quads had to turn round back to Ramabanta. When quads clutch had started slipping, and that forespells only more trouble that we didn't want to sit with later. At least it wasn't all rocky terrain. We reached a stretch of 500 meters that was nice and flat. Unfortunately, that didn't last too long. Bolly, who is better known for his two-wheel bike expertise, went investigating what lies ahead, finding very loose rocks on this incline. The surface being very wet and the absolute lack of traction makes this a very, very tough section. And thus towing is the best solution. Winters can be cold with the lowlands getting down to minus 7 degrees, that's 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and the highlands to minus 18 degrees Celsius, 0 degrees Fahrenheit at times. We face an average temperature of 2 to 3 degrees and the snow starting to pile up. We caught up with the other half of the group. Johan Swanepoel and his Rubicon sporting 33-inch tyres slipping out and getting stuck. How many, how many, how many rocks did you move today already? <laughs> I move more rocks than they in dispatch. <laughs> With a lot of rock packing, forwarding and backwarding, and winching from the landy, we finally got Johan out of trouble. Trouble was, Johan was leading the pack, so nobody could tow him from the front, something that would have made life much, much easier. Here comes Donovan not having any trouble making his way up. Boys being boys, the snow proved to be too tempting and the snow fight erupted, as if we weren't cold enough already. Andre Bjernica gave us the biggest shock of the day when he almost lifted himself over on his side, getting the adrenaline of the team properly pumping. Philip Wise and his Navarro behind Andrew 
carrying the load of the ranger that returned to the trade post and had to be winched over this section. Luckily, Andrew sustained no damage to his vehicle. Reaching a very narrow chasm, we had to squeeze through under the watchful eye of our newfound spectators. Perhaps this section doesn't look so challenging on screen, but with a very sharp decline and a road that cambers into it, this can be exceptionally dangerous. Let it grow, whoa. whoa. Captain Fearless, exercising expert steering control, and Derek slides out. Cattle represent wealth in the Sutu, and the Basutu value cows way above money. The wealthy villager usually lives in a concrete blockhouse with a metal roof instead of a rondavel. Um, yeah, no, everything went well, barring the fact that we've now split the group. The, uh, the other guys have, are quite a bit ahead of us. I um, believe our Suzu's broken a CV joint or something. Um, the Rubicon uh, um, Jeep and the Defender have gone ahead. They, I think they're clearing the, the top tonight. Um, we've got a broken something here yeah, where they're going to start stripping this Jeep now. So we're going to pitch tent here tonight. Um, we've managed to speak to some of the locals, we've offered them some money, so we're going to be camping pretty much where we are, and if we can't get the bucky fixed, we're going to be leaving it here. Um, we'll see what happens tonight. Now we need some mechanical. Yeah. Making radio contact with the other group, we shot up a flare to compare our positions. This display of fire got the hearts of the locals pumping. Later that night, we rested our tired bodies next to a warm fire. The labours of the day taking its toll on some more than others. Or maybe it was the old brown sherry. With that to think about, we turn in for the night, finding it surprisingly warm in the village hut. The next morning, we shifted more luggage over to the other vehicles as Jan made arrangements with the chief of the village to leave his 4x4 with them as we continued on our trek. Without any spares, that car was not going anywhere. Jan would later return in even deeper snow to retrieve his vehicle. Lesotho is one of only two African countries that share borders with only one other country. In Lesotho's case, it is completely surrounded by South Africa and is landlocked. 
The other country, Gambia, shares a border only with Senegal. Now we had only six kilometers left of the Baboons Pass, but they proved to be the most difficult of the entire trip. Awesome. We continued through the enchanted country with its frozen waterfalls. The Navara carrying the load of the other vehicles we left behind was doing really, really well under the circumstances. Well, we're day three now. Uh, we've managed to strip the side shaft out of the Jeep. We are about two kilometers from the top. So we're very, very close now and uh, all going well. Bit of a rocky piece we're going up here. We're getting a lot of snow now. Boys are all having fun, a couple of nervous guys. But uh, I think when we get to the top and we crack a beer, it's going to be all good. There's a mud flap. Right in front of you. Making good progress, Donovan had a quick stop to check his line of approach. Turning sharply, he rolls back, landing on a little pebble. And there is the little pebble. Can I come back a little bit? Just watch, Just watch out, huh? No, I think for the other piece. He fortunately sustained some damage in the form of a bent bull bar and an injured like fender. At least Donovan is still smiling. <laughs> Unfortunately not.
Now we found ourselves 2,600 meters above sea level. And the world definitely looks different from up here. With that, we arrived at the very last hindrance before the end of our journey. Holly and Jan Swanepoel made it through first, and that seemed to instill confidence in the rest of us as we followed suit. With tears in our eyes from the cold, or maybe just a little emotion, we'd reached the end of our journey. Taking a moment to pose for photos, to mark an adventure we would tell stories about for years to come. We left the mountain kingdom with a feeling of being touched by something bigger than ourselves, a feeling only ex exploration into the unknown that nature can bring.